Piaget called himself a genetic epistemologist, which is hardly the same thing as a psychologist, but Piaget was actually interested, this, and this is something you won't hear in most classes about Piaget, when Piaget was an adolescent, he was very obsessed by the growing split between religion and science. In fact, he wrote a novel about that. And uh, he took it upon himself, his life's goal was to reconcile the gap between religion and science. So, there's something you don't know about. Did anybody know that about Piaget? How many people know? You knew that? How did you learn that? Ah, well, that's, that's a good way of learning things. So, how many of you knew who, know who Piaget is? Oh, that's good. How many don't? You, it's, it's okay if you don't. You're probably engineers or some damn thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, Piaget became interested in how knowledge developed, and he started with the infant, and he's very interested in how the infant, who's an embodied creature, you know, who, who has a body, which turns out to be very important if you want to have a psyche, how the infant comes to construct his world. And I, I really like the Piagetian approach because it melds nicely with our discussion of both personality, the stable elements of personality, and the transformative elements of personality. So, you know, because Piaget has a stage theory of development, and um, he doesn't concentrate a tremendous amount on the intervening period of chaos between the stages of development, but, um, but, but the idea is still there. So, as it is, say, in... Uh, Thomas Kuhn's work on the history of science, which Piaget was aware of. <clears throat> From, so, I, I want to lay out the Piagetian theory, because one of the things that Piaget was really good at was understanding that the psyche is not like a floating soul. And, you know, people, we believe, perhaps, that we've dispensed with most of the religious presuppositions that interfere with our scientific clarity, which we certainly haven't. But one idea that's, that lurks deeply, it's very difficult to abandon for a variety of reasons, is the idea that, you know, you have a consciousness that's sort of like a soul that's sort of stuck in your body. You know, and, and that's sort of, you might think about that as your ego, or you might think about it as the I that you experience when you talk about yourself. It's like a floating consciousness. You know, and that, that's... That's led people like artificial intelligence researchers for the longest time to imagine that they could embody a mind inside complicated machines in, in, that would function perhaps in the same way that your mind functions. And Piaget is a really good antidote to that because what Piaget points out very clearly is that you cannot have a mind like we have without having the body to begin with. And so the, one of the ways that you can conceptualize that because it's very important is that your personality is actually oriented towards action rather than perception of the objective world. It's like, what the hell do you care about the objective world? We didn't even discover it until 500 years ago. You know, in, in a sense, what you're concerned about is how to act in the world. And your conceptions, although you may think about them as conceptions of the objective world, that isn't what they are. What they are instead is abstractions of how to act in the world. And Piaget explains this in a beautiful way, because he starts with the infant, and he talks about how the infant's body develops in sync with its psyche, and how the two things are, like, absolutely, integrally interlocked. And it's a lovely idea, and I, I, I think, not only do I think it's right, I think that all the evidence in the last 30 years points towards it being right. You know, we haven't been able to make artificial intelligence without embodying the intelligence in something that acts. So, for example, the Google cars, are, they're getting pretty damn smart. But they have a body, fundamentally. They're things that can act in the world. You know, and it turns out to be more difficult to walk than it does to calculate, you know, extremely complex math mathematical formulae, which a computer can do in, you know, a billionth of a second, even though we haven't got computers that can walk around in the real world. That turns out to be difficult. So Piaget tells you how to build a psyche from the bottom up. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a prerequisite, I think, for accurate understanding of the sorts of things that we're going to discuss. People usually start talking about depth psychology, psychoanalysis, with Freud. And then move to Jung, say, and perhaps Adler, as accomplices, or no, that's not the right word, uh, um, apprentices of Freud. And I think that's probably because the Freudians got a hold of the 
had the best biographies written first. But Jung was influenced by Freud, but he was equally influenced by Nietzsche. And in fact, Jung's primary concerns were associated with Nietzsche's primary concern. And Nietzsche's primary concern was that God had died in the late 1900s. So Nietzsche, the philosopher, announced that. It's a famous announcement. God is dead. God is dead. Sometimes you see that written on bathroom walls. God is dead. Nietzsche. Nietzsche is dead. God. Um, <clears throat> what Nietzsche was, was, was observing was that, and this is something you all know implicitly, is that the body of knowledge that human beings had evolved over centuries that was encapsulated within religious thinking had emerged in conflict with the body of knowledge that was produced primarily in Europe over about a 400 year period ending, say, in the beginning of the 20th century and the two forms of knowledge seemed incommensurate the claims of religion and the claims of science did not seem to be mutually harmonious and the consequence of that, as far as Nietzsche was concerned, was that the religious substructure upon which, at that point, Western civilization was built was rendered invalid and the problem with that from a Nietzschean perspective was, well there were two problems, one was okay then what the hell are we doing and why and the second was, so that's a nihilistic problem, right, if there's no ultimate meaning then why do anything, which is a perfectly reasonable question and then the second problem was, well in the absence of comprehensive systems of meaning if you don't want to be nihilistic what do you do? And Nietzsche's answer was, well, you develop totalitarian systems to replace religion, which is exactly what happened in the 20th century. And that didn't seem to be a very good solution. And we're certainly not done with that problem yet. So that's the central problem that Nietzsche posed, was like, we had these evolved systems of meaning, and science undercut them, or apparently undercut them. And that left people technologically enlightened, but spiritually deprived. And that state of spiritual deprivation, given that your primary orientation in the world is towards action, is equivalent to a mass mental disease. And it manifests itself in nihilism or in the penchant for adopting totalitarian belief systems. It's a big problem. It killed millions of people in the 20th century. You know, it's not usually regarded as a form of personality pathology, but that's just because people don't think about it properly.